This is Mag Mag Max Headroom, and what you're about to witness is one of the most sinister-sounding intros to one of the greatest epics ever produced. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy. stop and look around once in a while you could miss it hello and welcome back to another episode of do just like the 80s i'm your host rj mcgreedy and for this episode we're going to be taking you guys back to the year in 1986 and we're going to be having a look at the comedy movie from down under it's crocodile dundee and to do this show i've got a special guest today it's the witch from down under witch how you doing buddy i am awesome uh, and in uh, true mcdundee style g'day Oh yeah, man. Good day, buddy. Listen, buddy, um, there's a lot of people out there listening to this show who may not know who you are, so do you want to tell me a bit about yourself, a bit about the uh, Doomsday podcast, and a little bit about the new show that you're putting together? Oh, look, so many shows, so popular, it's so hard. So, my current show is Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock on the Legion Network, Uh much like Dude Looks Like the 80s, uh, I run the gambit of all sorts of movies, uh, supposedly from the safety of the future, where I hide in seclusion and drag people unwillingly to watch movies with me. Uh, and I think at the moment we're doing uh, our summer series, and I've just released, uh, at the time of this recording, The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini, uh, which is... Not a good movie. Uh, it is not a good movie. But I watched it, and uh, we've got some other really fantastic ones coming up. And seeing as you've mentioned my new show coming, I uh, will be releasing the Gangs of Hollywood podcast in uh, in the next couple of weeks, which is talking about movie gangs and gangsters and mobsters and Yakuza, just for something a little different. Yeah, I saw that you had a new... Um uh, po- podcast that you post on Facebook, the uh, Gangs pod- podcast that you're doing. So that looks pretty cool. But just going back to Doomsday Clock, that was actually one of the first shows that I listened to um, about three years ago or so. And I love it, mate. It's really good. I like what you're doing. It actually sounds like you're you're in the future in a funny sort of way. I, I am secretly in the future, yes. Secretly, through, through the power of the internet, I live in a bunker in the future, which is, you know, according to Mad Max, that's what Australia is. Well, it's funny you say that because um, when I watched these films when I was a kid, you know, on VHS like Mad Max and Crocodile Dundee, I thought that's what was going on in Australia because you didn't have any social media or anything like that. And uh, I thought it was just a complete Mad Max territory down under. Yeah, it, it, it splits between Mad Max uh, yeah, Mad Max and the bush. That's it. That, that's all there is. There's Mad Max land and then there's the bush with all the crocodiles and deadly animals. That's it. Now, it's a great show, buddy, and obviously I started out as a listener um, on your show, and now I'm podcasting myself, so it's all it's all been good fun, it's been a good adventure. Mmm, made, made the big leap. Yeah, kind of uh, Ricky Morgan's helped me along the way, he's kind of been a bit like Obi-Wan Kenobi out of Star Wars, you know, he's kind of handed me like a lightsaber as if it's a microphone. <laughs> this was your father's mic. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's it. I mean, Bo Rands is where you're going to go and say, hey, I'm really your dad. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing, we're having to get my bloody hand chopped off or something. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, unfortunately, to, to stay in Legion Network, you've got to lose a hand. That's just the way it works. But it's a great network, man. I mean, it's almost like we're all the same sort of person from all around the world, you know what I mean? We're all having fun and stuff. It's a hive mind, mate. Yeah, it, it's a hive mind. <laughs> There's a globe of, of of guys in their underwear just recording random stuff. Oh well, yeah, exactly. It's like 
it's like Bo Ranzel has uh, brought us all together like some sort of conjuring wizard or something like that. <laughs> he's definitely something. Well, if you're listening, Bo, we love you, man. We do. And he's got a great voice as well, you know. Mm. And if you struggle mm. to go to sleep one night, you could just phone Bo up and say, can you put a tape on, some sort of relaxation <laughs> tape on for us? Just, I t- just ring him up, just call him on Skype and say, Bo, what have you got to hand? Can you just start reading to me? Read, read me a recipe, Bo. You don't have to put it on a pants. Just read me a recipe. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's it. <laughs> hey, I've got a recipe on here on how to make an apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> put eight ounces of flour into the bowl. <laughs> Peel those apples. Mm. <laughs> oh, brilliant. That's great. So, shall we move on and have a look at this movie then, mate? Have a look at Crocodile Dundee. Certainly. Let, let, let's talk about the the icon that is Crocodile Dundee. Okay then, guys. Well, you know the drill. We will play you a trailer. It's Crocodile Dundee going back to 1986, and we will see you soon. He was raised in the land down under, where a man thinks on his feet speaks with his fists and lives by his wits. Two beers, all right? One for me, one for me, mate. A legendary figure about to encounter a world more treacherous than any he has ever known. Hey, Big Dundee from Australia. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Just going down for a couple of days. Probably see you around. Bye. This is your first trip to New York. First trip anywhere. Well, we might just have to give you one for free. <laughs> yeah. One what? So how are you finding New York? Give me the balloon to take us along. That's why I love it, because I fit right in. G'day. Hello. Sorry. G'day. Look. Oh. 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 My back! Stop it! Stop it! When are you coming home, mate? Well, if you can manage, Wal, I'd like to stay a while. Wouldn't have anything to do with a certain lady writer, would it? Paramount Pictures presents Your pal, Senor Meek. Paul Hogan. Um, hey, my man, what's happening? Uh, wait. As Crocodile Dundee. You got a light, buddy? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And your wallet. He's got a knife. <laughs> a knife? That's a knife. Crocodile Dundee. And welcome back, everybody. So, Crocodile Dundee. So, the synopsis for this film is a, an American reporter goes to the Australian outback to meet an eccentric crocodile hunter and invites him to, into the New York City. It's a PG-13, it's got a 97-minute runtime, and it's classed as a action-adventure comedy. It's starring, as we all know, Paul Hogan, Linda Kowalski as Sue, John Melian as Walter, Reginald Vell Johnson as Gus, and it was directed by Peter Feynman, and it was written and, and produced by Paul Hogan, so he actually wrote this movie. It was made for $10 million, and it skyrocketed in the 80s. It had a massive, um, it was a massive hit in the 80s. It was the second biggest film to come out in 1986 next to Top Gun and it made a return of $353 million. And Paul Hogan himself, he just didn't know this. It was going to be a hit when he made it. He just said, I wanted to make a nice little funny adventure movie from the the 80s. I mean... Yeah, that's pretty much Hogs on most stuff. Well, that's the other thing I was going to say. I mean, that's the thing about Paul Hogan. I was watching a documentary on him the other day, and it just seems like he is just being himself in these movies. You know, he just um, 
he's he, he's obviously acting, but you know, a, a big part of him is is just being himself and being funny and all the comedy and stuff. Yeah, well, at that point in time, he was look. He he had he did TV um, and he had like a comedy a sketch show in in the late seventies, and it was uh, that. And then he moved into this. But up until you know, like this got really big. He was just a real average bloke. You know, he was married to a woman called Nolene, and <laughs> okay, you know, he, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, he, all his comedy was real down to earth, working class type stuff. He was just an average Australian bloke. Well, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I do like this film is for him, Paul Wogan as the actor. I mean, there's a lot about him that's about me. You know, certainly his sense of humour. Yeah, doesn't really mind taking the piss out of himself and things like that. And it's um, it's only a building block for me as when I was growing up. You know. Oh yeah. Um, hell, I wanted to be Crocodile Dundee. You know. <laughs> well, when I grow up, I want to be Crocodile Dundee definitely. So this came out around about time, I must have been about 10 years old, riding about on the uh, BMX bike and stuff like that. Hell, I'm sort of showing my age a little bit there, aren't I? <laughs> that, that's all right, mate. I was 17. <laughs> oh, man. Well, there you go, then. We have been found out on the show, haven't we? Eh? <laughs> oh, man. But at this time, whilst I was riding about on my BMX bike, I lived opposite a movie theatre. Wow. And I remember seeing Crocodile Dundee coming out. I saw the movie poster. And to be honest with you, mate, I thought they were making another Indiana Jones movie or something like that, you know? Because, <laughs> you, know, you know, as a kid, you look at the post and you try to work it out for yourself. And I saw the crocodile and I saw the hat and I thought, he looks like Indiana Jones. And then I saw the crocodile and I thought, well, maybe they're making another yeah, I... alligator film like the one they made in the you know, early 80s. So I couldn't really work it out, mate, you know? Yeah, yeah. M- more, more romancing the stone than uh, than uh, than uh, Indiana Jones. <laughs> An Australian knockoff of Indiana Jones. You know, like we said before, you know, I mean, you know, as kids in the 80s, you know, you see that video cover and you try to work out what film it is, you know, and most of the time you can, mm. or it's sold in a different sort of way. But with this movie, I was like, what the hell is this movie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone was thinking, what is this? And then it made a, a heap of money. <laughs> oh, yeah, big time. Oh, yeah, massive amount of money. And um, like I said at the beginning of the show, you know, to Paul Hogan's surprise, I don't think he expected it to do as well. As it did. And he also said, you know, he wanted to Australia to have like almost like a sort of hero in some ways to sort of reach out to the States. I mean, I know Australia already had it with the Mad Max films and you oh, know, that's yeah. another film from oh, Australia yeah. that did incredibly yeah. well. Yeah, the, there was there was nothing comparable. And I imagine Dundee was massive out in Australia, well, was it? Oh, it was. It was massive. Because, I mean, like, like, like Paul Hogan, I said, everyone knew who he was, right? He was your average bloke. You know, he was on telly, um, you know, the whole family was sitting around and watching and he, you know, he did characters and he was he was funny and, you know, I think everyone wanted him to do well. You know, they wanted his movie to be really good. Um, and it was, it was, it was awesome. Uh, and uh, the second one, eh, not so much. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I, I didn't think it was such a bad follow-on from the, um, you know, the first movie. Oh, no, nah, the the first one, it, the first one has it has all the good jokes in it. I reckon the second one, it's just a bit like, oh, that worked the first time. We'll just try it again. Oh yeah, when you say like, yeah, I kind of get that. But no, I'm a fan of the second one. I think it's got some comedy gold in it from the you know from the first movie. Oh, don't get me wrong, I like it. Yeah, I like it. I mean, especially with that punk dude, you know, it's, that's comedy gold, isn't it? You know, he says, you know, what's the chance of you getting out here with that jacket? You know? And he goes, gets his knife out, and then he goes, dum! Yeah. He goes, ah, oh, better than average. <laughs> <laughs> it's quality stuff. And then you got the bloke who's trying to jump off the building, you just got Mick walking around with his hand in his pocket, it's just saying, oh, I'm just having to walk around, mate, you know, I'm just getting a bit just of fresh a walk air. about, mate. It's all right. He goes, I can't jump with you looking. He's like, that's all right, I'll turn around and look the other way, you know. <laughs> yeah, don't mind me. I'll be all right. Oh man, it's just movie gold, isn't it? And like I say, it's it's almost like the planets aligned with this movie at the time, and uh, you get your five bucks worth, and you know it's got a good story, characters, a good comedy, it's got some really good music in it, and it's also got some moral morals to the story that you can take away as well, you know, because Crocodile Dundee is a you know he's ultimately he's quite a good guy, isn't he? Really? Yeah, yeah, a bit, bit of a bit of a story. I mean, when was your born, Mick? Oh. In the summertime. <laughs> yeah, they said it was in the summertime. You think that's funny, right? I, I have spoken to to Aboriginal Australians who will say that. When were you born? I don't know. 
I think it was summer. Yeah, legit. Like, so I, I lived in the territory for a year. Um, so I've been to Kakadu and all those sort of places where they where they shot this. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not as bad now, but some of some of the older generation of Aboriginals are legit like that. They don't they no calendars, no watches, no nothing. Don't care. Don't want to be involved. And, and it's real. You know, it's back to the earth type stuff, and it's freaking amazing. Oh wow! So that's obviously a bit of homework that um, Paul Hogan has done for the movie. Oh yeah. And then you got the other bits in this film where someone asks him what the time is, and he just looks up in the sky and he says, "Ah, oh, it's about one. It's one twenty, you know, exact." And then Sue looks at her watch, and it's like it's exactly one twenty, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, uh, yeah. It's two twenty. It's just like yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's have a look at this film. So the film starts off with Sue, Linda Kowalski, who is in Australia already, and she's talking to her very sleazy boyfriend who's from New York, and she tells him that she wants to stay out there for a little bit longer because she's got this big story of a crocodile hunter who's got a missing leg, who's been in an altercation in the outback, and he's been surviving in the outback for many days, and she thinks it's going to be a big story. Um, So this is how the movie starts off. And you get an incredible scene where Sue hitches a ride with a helicopter and goes to the outback. And you've got some beautiful scenery here. And you've also got a really good soundtrack. It's got a mixture of um, like the Aboriginal music. And um, it's just a really good amalgamation of all that. And um, I think you've got some guitar in there and stuff like that. So it really sort of draws you into the movie. Yeah, the score is it, do, it works really well with it, and you know you get you get some really nice um, aerial shots too, which I really like. You know, it's some really nice shots of the territory. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because um, you know, I've never been to Australia, and when I was watching this as a kid, you know, you get to watch these films and you get to see these landscapes, and I just thought it looked beautiful. You know, looking at the outback and all that, so it's great. <laughs> And then you've got um, Sue that turns up at Walkabout Creek and she is met by Wally and he's got his socks, his white socks, pulled all the way up to his knees. What a look, eh? That was a look. That was a, that was a real look. Well, you know what? Next time I go out treasure hunting, I think I might go for a look like that. Ditch the old Indiana Jones look and go for this, you know? <laughs> oh, man. And that actor is uh, John Mellion. He's... Um, He's a known actor in Australia, isn't he? He's been in a couple of movies. Yeah, he's an, he's an Australian television mainstay. Like he again been around, done television, done movies, done all sorts of stuff. He's been around literally forever. Yeah, I seem to remember him being in a film called Outback or Walkabout, something like that. It had Jenny Agata in it or something. Oh, vaguely, yeah, that vaguely sounds familiar. There was a lot of those in the seventies. Um, you know, picnic and hanging rock and yeah, walkabout and all that sort of stuff. So So Sue goes to Walkabout Creek and she goes down to the pub and this is where she meets Crocodile Dundee and you get a bowie knife that comes throwing through the bar and then Crocodile Dundee comes crashing through and he's got a croc in his hand and he gets up to the bar and he says, I'll have one for me and my mate. And this is where Sue's looking going, what the hell is this? This isn't what I was expecting. No, no, definitely not what she was expecting. You know, where's where's the mid- missing leg? What's happened to that? <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. And then we're introduced to a character called Donk who's having a competition with some beer on his head. So, do, do you know? So, have you ever heard the the, the word Donk before? No, I've um, I haven't heard of it until um, I watched Crocodile Dundee. So, what's what does it mean? Yeah. So, so no, no. So Donk Donk is. Is a slang term for the engine in a car. Oh, is it? I I'd never heard of that expression before. I didn't even realise it all the times I watched this movie. Yeah. It's so you, when I heard it, I went, I totally forgot that. Yeah, they called him Donk. And it's just yeah, like like anything that's got a big engine in it, that's a Donk. Oh right, because like I say, I've I've only ever heard that word in this movie. To be honest with you, you know, Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, I mean, he's probably the local mechanic. No, like I say, now you say that, does sort of uh, make sense now. And now you've got Mick having a dance with Sue, and he's having a bit of a good time, he likes a beer, he likes to have a bit of a laugh, and he doesn't really take any shit because you've got the poachers in the corner, and they're, and they're starting to take the Mick out of Mick. There's no pun there intended. 
<laughs> and then Mick throws his authority around a little bit, doesn't he? And then he punches this poacher and he says, I won't have heart, bad language used in front of a lady like that. And then Sue's going, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, because you just start a fight for no reason. That happens all the time. And the poacher guy as well recognise him from somewhere as well. Yeah, again, yeah, heap of Australian stuff. You know, again, TV, movies, yeah. Yeah, I think I recognised him from the Flying Doctors or something like that. Oh, uh, yes, yes, he was probably a staple on the Flying Doctors. They all all did a stint at one turn or, or another. Yeah, that's right, I thought I recognised him from somewhere. But um, So the next day, um, Sue joins Mick and Waddy to go on an adventure on the Outback and they get onto Mick's truck and go to the location where he had, supposedly had his bed... Um, leg bitten off by a crocodile and uh, where he was going fishing so along the way they come across their first obstacle which is a uh, water buffalo or something like that yeah yeah when they're driving up the path and and the uh, water buffalo is in the middle of the road just stopping them that's right um going anywhere and, and mick does his uh yeah he does his uh, his magic trick he certainly does yeah he does his bushman magic bit of witchcraft on the water buffalo and Puts it down to the ground with his hands, and Sue's starting to take photographs and that. that and that is like that is that is the most amazing piece of bullshit you will ever see. That trick with <laughs> oh, big time, yeah. And I think they actually sedated that war buffalo in real life or something, didn't they? Yes, yes. They literally put it to sleep. Poor bloody animal. But yeah, they put it to <laughs> yeah, sleep. No, but I don't think you'll get away with that now, would you? Oh no, no, definitely not. So once they've dealt with the water buffalo, they move on and then they get to the location where Mick had the confrontation with the crocodile and you see the boat that's all been trashed and beaten up. And then Mick's telling her about the story where he's rolled the crocodile over and he's talked him out of it and all that sort of stuff. And Sue's taking photographs and then while she's taking photos, she finds some gun shells and then she says to him, well, what do you need these for then? And he goes, oh... Bloody big mar- barramundi out here there is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. barras are pretty big fish. I, I don't think you need to go go fishing with a shoddy to, to get them, but yeah, they're big fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, then she Sue talks to him about his leg, didn't she? And then um, she says, oh, I thought you, you know, had your leg been off, Mick. And he goes, nah, more like a love bite, really. And <laughs> he sort of pulls his trouser up and shows him and like cutting his leg. So after Sue takes some more photographs, they set up camp for the night and uh, during the night they can hear uh, the poachers turn up and they're shooting kangaroos. And Sue says to Mick, you know, what are they doing? And he says, well, it's not illegal to do that. But then he looks at her and thinks, oh, I'll better do something about it. So this is where you get a funny scene where he picks up one of the dead kangaroos and starts shooting back at the poachers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and when they're all gone, he just drops and goes, good job, Skippy. Yeah, I know. It's a bloody hilarious scene, isn't it? <laughs> did you guys get Skippy the bush kangaroo? I did. Did you get that when you yeah, were kids? Yeah, we got him in DJ. Yeah, we got him over here. I remember oh, we, um, yes. watching this film with my mum and she just went, oh, no, not Skippy. Skippy's dead. <laughs> oh, poor Skippy. Hey, can I tell you a fun fact about Skippy? Yeah, well, so we're going to say he's not a real kangaroo or something like that. No, well, the the wild shot you saw of Skippy was actually a kangaroo. But yep. any time you saw Skippy with Sonny and you saw the paws, like Skippy's paws and, you know, Sonny would be talking to him, they were actually a pair of bottle openers. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, they were kangaroo paw bottle openers. Anytime you saw saw Sonny and Skip together, and like Sonny be holding his little paws, there was a bloke just out of camera shot holding a pair of bottle openers with kangaroo <laughs> paws on the end of it. Oh man, that's something I'm not going to be able to unsee now. Every time I see Skippy, it's funny you saying that because that's actually remind me of the um, all roads lead to the thing with me and John Carpenter, as you know. But the Petri dish scene when uh, Kurt Russell or RJ McCreed is holding the um, Petri dish. And it's actually a plastic hand, and I didn't know that after all these years, you know. Yeah, I know. All, all of a sudden, it's ruined, right? It's it's 100% ruined forever now. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, that's it. I mean, next thing someone's going to tell me is it's not a real movie, you know? <laughs> What's going on? 
<laughs> oh dear, but anyway, moving on from that, moving on from the thing, back to Crocodile Dundee. So Sue and Mick go back to the camp, and this is where they meet um, an Aborigine guy called Neville Bell. He comes to the camp to visit. Yes. And Sue is very respectful to him, isn't she? And then um, she says, you know, can I take your photograph? And then that's where he comes out and says, no, you can't take my photograph. And she thinks, oh, is it because I'm going to take your spirit away? He goes, no, it's because you've got your lens cap on. Uh, Yes. Played by David Gulpil, a very famous Aboriginal actor. Oh, right. Was he, uh, where else has he been in? Oh, no, David Gulpil has been in a heap of movies. Um, I think probably the one that always comes to mind is Storm Boy. Um, and then, like you said, he, he's done a heap of Australian TVs and movies. But yeah, David Gulpil is um, is quite famous. Oh, okay. So Neville goes into the woods, doesn't he? And then he starts walking off and then Sue's going, it's so dark out there, how can he see? And then Mick goes, oh, well, you know, he's got some sort of telekinesis where he can see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you got Neville walking through the bush and he steps on a twig and he goes, oh, I hate the bloody bush, didn't he? <laughs> oh, I, oh, I hate the bloody bush. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> I mean, that's what I love about this film. It just draws you in and then it just sort of throws you all of a sudden with something like that. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. But then um, after this, you've got uh, Mick who goes to have a tribal dance with the tribal elders and Sue says, can I come along? to this ceremony and he says no you, you can't come along because it's only me that's been sworn in so he leaves it at the campfire but then Sue out of curiosity goes to the campfire and she's just hiding in the bush and she's taking photographs but then she gets clocked by Mick and then Mick looks back at her and just sort of smiles and then later on at the camp Sue goes well how did you know I was there and he just has a sort of moment of silence and she's thinking is he going to say telekinesis or something like that? And he just goes, well, no, you're a woman and you're curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're all nosy buggers. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So then I think at this point, Sue's kind of gone from being curious about Mick to being a little bit more drawn to him. Yes. And then the next day in the morning, they head off to a point and Sue comes out and says, you know, what's it like for a city girl? to survive out here in the bush and Mick says I don't think you'll last five minutes so Sue takes the challenge and she walks off by herself and this is the bit where you get the bit where she's in a bikini um, filling up a canteen by the water yes yeah in the in in the little black one piece and uh I tell you oh yeah and uh, when I see a Scene like this, I think of the quote that Gary Hill from Cinema Beef Podcast said um, when he guested on my show. He said, you know, as a 10-year-old, um, if your balls haven't dropped by now, they have now. <laughs> <laughs> With a vengeance. <laughs> it's just like, whoa. <laughs> yes, Remembering that this is a PG-13 <laughs> film. Oh, man, you're getting a hell of a movie here for a PG-13, I tell you that. Oh dear, but then after that, this is where you get the scene where the uh, she's filling up the canteen, this is where the uh, crocodile comes jumping out of her and it grabs the canteen, she's struggling, and this is where Mick Dundee does his tars and stuff, and he comes in and rescues her, and he puts a knife through the head of the crocodile, and um, he kills a croc and he rescues Sue, but yeah, it's a bit of a jump scene, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it's a bit of a jump scare, it comes diving out of the water, and then you know, Mick jumps on top and stabs it in the brain, and saves her. And I guess you get live crocs like that out there, don't you? Well, you know, these this was shot in Kakadu, and there are live crocs in Kakadu, like swimming in the water and all that sort of stuff. They're all out there just look, looking for something to eat. Well, I'll remember that next time I'm in the outback of an army. <laughs> yep, word to the wise. <laughs> Absolutely. But after this scene, um, so they're coming to the end of the venture. They go back to Wally and... During the venture, Sue's beginning to get some feelings for Mick Dundee and she decides to invite him back to New York City. And Wally at first says, well, no, I'm not sure about it. And she goes, I'll pay. And he goes, well, actually, that's yeah, a good yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's really, really good. Oh, yeah, big time. And then you got Mick, um, next thing you got him getting on a plane. He's sat there in the chair and he's looking out the window and Sue goes, you all right, Mick? And he's gone, yeah, yeah, I'm all right, I'm okay. And then the next shot, you guys, the plane taking off, and then all you hear is Mick Dundee go, whoa, shit. 
And so from here on, you've got Mick Dundee that has his first trip into a city, which is New York City. And what I like about it here is that you get that switch from Mick's territory to Sue's territory, which is kind of equally like a jungle in its own right. Yeah. And the other thing I like is the music here. That makes a change here as well. It makes a switch. So you've got the Outback music, which is incredible, as I said before, with the Aborigine music. Mm. And then now you've got the New York City music, and you can just sort of hear the change in the tones. Yeah. And, and, and again, that it immerses you into the movie. You know, you get that completely different feel. And, and you know, it's a bit like, well, we're not in the bush anymore. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, you probably you got the most eighties New York City soundtrack you've ever got in your life, and yeah, oh dear. And then you got making a yellow cab, and he says hello to this guy, and he reaches his hand out the window, and he says, "Hello, mate. I'm here for a few days. Might meet up again sometime like that." And the trivia here for this guy is it's the um, dude from The Warriors who yes, plays the orphans yes. looks a little bit like David Schwimmer yeah in a weird kind of way but yeah that is that dude so there's a little bit of Warriors trivia there for this movie and then you've got Mick um, who goes to a hotel room a very posh hotel and it's probably one of the biggest hotel rooms he's ever seen and he goes in there and he turns the TV on and he says yep yeah, that's what I've seen it, it's I Love Lucy it, it's I Love Lucy you know I just went oh my god yeah they're, they're still showing uh, reruns of I Love Lucy yeah, because at that moment, he's probably thinking, well, that's the only thing they show on that TV. <laughs> and then you've got the hotel dude who's helped with the luggage, and he puts his hand out to Mick, sort of waiting for a tip, and then Mick just goes, yeah, hello, mate, I'm Mick Dundee, like that. And then C goes, it's okay, um, takes out a couple of bucks from her purse, and she, yeah. <laughs> she yeah, goes, I'll take care of this. there you go. And then old Mick goes, oh, so you've got to pay for the room up front, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's brilliant. Oh, Mick's just going, oh, it's all right. It's just a couple of bucks for this room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's all anything costs, a couple of bucks. And then after this, Mick goes into the toilet and he sees that they got two dunnies. And he says, oh, have you got two dunnies? And then Sue goes, well, I'll let you work that out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Another classic scene. <laughs> yeah. And then Mick works it out, doesn't he? And he leans out the window and he shouts to Sue and he's waving his hand. And he goes, it's for wiping your backside. <laughs> yeah, it's for washing your bum. <laughs> ah, it's brilliant. And then you get Mick, he's all settling into town. He has a ride around with a police officer on a horse that drops him off to the hotel and gives him back his knife. And then Mick gets invited out with um, her f- boyfriend, and he's a proper 80s sleazebag, isn't he? I mean, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah. He, he's playing the, the 80s, 80s tool to the epitome. Oh, yeah, only just. But I guess at the same time, you need this sort of knob in a movie because he sort of becomes like the sort of nemesis in a way for um, Mick Dundee. Yeah. So they're sat there, they're having some dinner, and the waiter comes over, he starts talking Italian or something like that. And then this um, sleaze bag starts making fun of Mick, and he starts saying, oh, I guess you want a kangaroo steak. And Mick sort of just shrugs it off on his shoulders, but he goes, yeah, well, I don't know how you pronounce it, but whatever, whatever that person's having over there, and then old Mick just gives him a right hook without anybody looking. <laughs> and then this guy just sort of falls into a daze, and it's like he's going, oh, I'm going to faint. So yeah. he proper sorts yeah, him out. Just goes, bang! <laughs> what, what does he say? He goes, oh, I, don't know, oh, yeah, I, I don't know what it's called. And then, yeah, then he just he clips in one, and he... <laughs> Boom. And it's just like, oh, jeez. You know, you couldn't do that now. You could. There's no way you could use a line like that now. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you wouldn't be able to get away with in this movie now, would you? You know, but then Paul Hogan said in a documentary recently, he said, you know, all these gags, there's no malice intended in these in these gags in these movies from him. Oh, no. That was just funny. Yeah. That was just funny. Well, that's it. And then the next day he goes to a party with Sue and it's probably the most 80s party you're ever going to see in your life. And you've got Sue wearing a very revealing red dress. That that red number? Oh, yes. Yes. I remember that red number quite well. And then we got Mick who meets the lady who he doesn't think is a lady, doesn't he? But I think I might have jumped ahead a bit here because there was that bit where he goes out with the cab driver, doesn't he? Oh, th- yeah, that's right, where he goes out with the cab driver. And he, he's out drinking and, and he meets a, uh, yes, a, a trans person and... Uh, <laughs> 
That's right, mixed chain away, and then old Marvin's sort of reaching around with his cigarette, and he's going, hey, it's a, it's a guy, and then Mick's going, what, what are you talking about? This is where his sort of naivety kicks in, and then he reaches, didn't he, and I'm surprised they get away with this, you know what I mean? He sort of just reaches out and just goes, oh, just checking, you know, you think, bloody hell, <laughs> oh, <my> God. <laughs> just, just checking, you all right? <laughs> it's like, Jesus. And then Mick does the same thing at the party. Yeah. But as it turns out, it is a woman, and then she comes out and goes, oh, wow, you know, maybe I should go to Australia more often. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, I might have to go to Australia. It's like, well, you know, if that's your thing, why not? And then you got Mick who goes into the bathroom, and you got a guy in there snorting a bit of cocaine, haven't you? Mm. <laughs> and you know what? This dude's actually got a title credit on IMVD called Cocaine Snorter. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be something to be really proud of. Now, you remember Crocodile Dundee? I'm the cocaine snorter in the kitchen. One of my greatest roles. <laughs> well, that's it, isn't it? You know, something going to tell his grandkids one day, isn't it? <laughs> and then you've got a slightly naive Mick here who thinks the bloke's suffering a cold. He goes, here, yeah, mate, I'll help you out. You know, balls the old coat up, puts it into yeah, a bowl. I can bowl. help you. You know, put the old tea towel over your head and start sniffing it in. Whack the tea towel on your head. You'll be right, mate. Now, get a, get, get a nose full of that. <laughs> Oh dear, classic Dundee, eh? And then you've got a song in the background, um, which is playing, which was a hit in the charts called Come Down to My Place, or I can't remember the name of the band now, Live It Up or something like that? It was it was Mental As Anything, yeah, Live It Up by Mental As Anything. Yeah, that was it. I think it did pretty well in the charts back then. I think I've got it kicking around in, on vinyl downstairs somewhere. Oh wow, nice. So then uh, Mick and Sue are spending some nice time together in New York and then this is where you get the classic scene where they're walking home together um, at night time and you get them out. It's an iconic scene, this. You know, that's the knife scene. Everybody knows it. When I talk about Crocodile Dundee, people bring this um, scene up straight away. It's almost as iconic as Brody blowing up the shark at the end of Jaws or Indiana Jones with a rolling ball behind him. But this is it, Mick Dundee. Uh, the classic knife scene. I was just It's iconic. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows that scene. If Even if they've never seen this movie, they know that scene. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, big time. I mean, even to the point where if you just Google Crocodile Dundee, it's nine times out of ten, this picture will come up more than the movie poster itself. Yeah. And then um, Sue so, uh, kisses Crocodile Dundee and they're starting to fall in love with each other. But then the next scene after this, uh, Sue invites Mick to a dinner with some family and this is where the sleaze bag proposes to her and, you know, Mick, this is completely out of the blue. He's he's, um, he's heartbroken. So after the party or the dinner, shall I say, um, Mick goes and drowns his sorrow with Marvin and, you know, Marvin leaves him some alcohol and leaves him on the street. And then Mick's walking down the street, and this is where he gets confronted by the pimp, which I forgot to mention earlier, which he punches and sorts out. And this pimp guy turns up with some heavies and takes on Mick. And this is where you get Gus, uh, the cab driver. And he rams her into the vehicle with a pimp, um, knocks him over, helps Mick Dundee out, and that's where he gets the gets the boomerang. Yes! Pulling the fin off the back of the car, using it like a boomerang. And that's where you get Mick come out and say, I knew you was tribal. You were, you, yeah, you, you, a Pigeon Jarrah tribe, yeah. You know, when you think about it, when I watch this scene, um, that's Sergeant Al Powell, isn't it? The actor from uh, Die Hard. So you think he's um, he's been alongside two iconic movie characters, hasn't he? Yes. And then the next day, Mick goes on a walkabout because that's it. He thinks um, the relationship is over with Sue and he's going to walk around New York City, which could be up to 18 months, as he said earlier on in the movie. And then he gives the hotel porter his knife, doesn't he? (laughs) Do this, yeah. Brilliant. And then Sue realises that she's made a mistake. She doesn't want to marry that sleaze bag. And then she wants to... Well, she goes to the hotel and she tries to find Dundee, but then the porter says, oh, he's gone on walkabout. And she goes, I'll walk about and she tries to find him. And then they end up at the metro station. And this is where you get the classic scene where people were relaying information back and forwards. And then you've got the two guys in here going, I love you, I love you. <laughs> and then you've got Mick who um, climbs over everybody, doesn't he? Like what they do, I guess, with the uh, sheep out in the outback. Yeah, yeah, where where the you, you get a blue dog that'll run across the top of the sheep when they're trying to get it back in the pen. Oh yeah, okay. 
So then Mick gets back to Sue and they kiss and they fall in love and that's it. And that's the end of the movie. So, And then it cuts to the uh, end credits. So that's it. That is Crocodile Dundee, the iconic movie from 1986. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. If you have seen it, I guess you're probably a fan. I don't know many people who don't like Crocodile Dundee. And it also spawned a couple of sequels, so go check those out. Uh, number two is pretty good. Uh, which, is there anything more you want to talk about on Crocodile Dundee? No, no. The epic really is like that. The rest of it's Mad Max Land, and everyone talks like Mick Dundee. They're all facts, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Brilliant. There you go, the priest there, the man from Darren Under. He's proven now that it's true. But um, thanks, Rich. I really appreciate you coming on board today. It's been a whole ton of fun having you on, on the show, mate. Anytime, buddy. You you tell me what you want to watch, and I am 100% there. I love your show. Uh, and, and your new show, too. Your new show is fantastic. I, I never get a chance to actually tell people I'm listening because it's over before I, I get a chance to tell people I'm listening. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you say that because... Uh, uh, was it called Sipes from Cinema Sipes said that um, he posted on there so I was listening I said I hope you enjoyed the show he said well it was over before I could actually post anything on, on Facebook <laughs> <laughs> well normally I listen on my commute and it's just like oh it's done but it was awesome no listen you're doing great work buddy great work yeah oh thanks mate no, I appreciate that but I was like the object of uh, Bite Size is the idea that I had. It's a bit like when you have a conversation with somebody about a movie. Uh, maybe you've just seen it at the cinema. I'll just say like something like Captain America or something like that. And you kind of have a 20-minute in-depth conversation where you bring up all the points of the movie and you've just pretty much rounded it all up. And that's kind of what I do with Bite Size Cinema. So you can sort of listen to it on your commute for sort of 20 minutes and you can go away and say... Okay, yeah, I kind of got the foundation of that movie now. I might want to go and see it, or it might be a film that you've you you might have already seen that you just want to revisit for, um, you know, twenty minutes or so on a podcast. So that's kind of like the object, really. Yeah, it, it encompasses everything you wanted to talk about in that movie. Yeah, and I know that you got a, a new show out as well, haven't you? Put something together. Uh, Gangs of Hollywood, not as yet. So I'm getting everything together. I've done some. Yeah, done some recordings on that. Um, hoping to have that out by the end of March. I want to get uh, get a few under my belt uh, and in the can, ready to release. So it's got a nice, solid release schedule. People get used to it, and you know we get some good listeners. So, but I'm uh, I've done a couple by myself, and I've got some guest spots uh, coming up next weekend to record. So I'm having a great time just putting it together. Brilliant. And what was the idea behind the show? What sort of got you to doing this podcast? Well, look, it, oddly enough, it actually stemmed out of a conversation that I had with someone. The, there's just been a movie released just recently called The True Story of the Kelly Gang, now, which is about Ned, Ned, Ned Kelly, right? Which is fine. People, Some people know about it, some people don't. He, you know, He's from like Victoria, where, where I grew up, and I've been through you know where he got killed and all that sort of stuff. But the very first feature film that was ever made was actually an Australian movie about the Kelly gang. And we had this long conversation about, you know, how Australian cinema has always been um, tied to our criminal past and, you know, that quite often, you know, there are gang and gangsters and that led into a conversation about all the movies that we love that have gangs in them. And I went, you know what? I'm going to do a podcast about that because I love all the movies we just talked about. And there was like freaking hundreds and it's just like, and I know there are other people that, you know, love that sort of stuff. So it was just like, yep, I'm going to give it a crack. Yeah, because when you say about the Kelly going, didn't um, Mick Jagger play Ned Kelly? He did. He did. Mick, Nick, Mick Jagger did play Mick Jagger, I think, in the mid-70s um, off the top of my head. But yeah, see, the, it is a, it's a famous Australian folktale. He's like an outlaw version of Iron Man, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and instead of saving people, he stole stuff. So, yeah, you know. Oh, man, I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> God. <laughs> no, 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 be sorry. That is, that, is, that is comedy gold. Oh, brilliant. But um, if I see anything gangster-related in the you know, movie world and all that sort of stuff, I'll post it on your show. Oh, yeah, go for it, man. Like I said, I've already lined up a good chunk of uh, actually uh, a bit of uh, Brit Hardman stuff to, to record on, so... 
Uh, I'm a big fan of, you know, the Guy Ritchie films and all that sort of stuff. So by all means, if you've got a favourite, chuck it up on the website. Oh, yeah, man. Well, you said it right there with Guy Ritchie. I mean, he um, brought out one of my favourite um, gangster movies, which is Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, you know. Oh, Lock, Stock is one of my all-time favourite movies. You know, especially with the other movie Snatch as well, especially that dog, you know, and he's like, they're in the car and he says, well, you shut that dog up. And he says, oh, I can't do anything. Give him a ball. And he gives him the ball and he bloody starts eating the ball and starts squeaking. Yeah, yeah, just... <laughs> oh. oh, that's brilliant. I think uh, Guy Richie's just brought out a new one, hasn't he? He's, um... The Gentleman. Yeah, that was it. I haven't seen it yet, but um, I look forward to having a look at that. Yeah, I haven't seen I'm looking forward to seeing it, actually. But um, ultimately, when I think about gangster movies, uh, that sort of genre, I think straight away of The Warriors and The Untouchables, um, two two fantastic movies. See, you've just you've just named two episodes from my first ten. Oh, right, okay. And the guest I have for The Untouchables is fantastic. I'm not going to tell you who, but but uh, yeah, he he's uh, yes. He, he is uh, definitely the Al Capone of podcasts. Let's just say that. Oh, brilliant, mate. Well, I look forward to listening to that. But the other film I was going to talk to you about while you're here, the man from down under, is um, Dead End Driving. I did that for me last episode. Dead End Driving. Very familiar with that movie. All right. Do you enjoy it? Yes. Yes, I listened to the show and and, uh, and laughed along because I, I watched that movie not so long ago. Oh, right. Was that for the first time? Nah, I'd, say I'd seen it a heaps of times. I pro- having said that, I probably hadn't seen it um, in f- probably five or six years. And I was having, a, again, having a conversation with somebody and they mentioned, uh, we, we were talking about movies and drive-ins and, I'd, and it was in my head and I knew what it was about and we were talking about people that are in that movie because there are, again, there's a whole bunch of people from Australian TV. Um, there's a there's a guy that's from the band that used to be on a variety show here, and it, and it all got it. And then I went, you know, what? I'm gonna to have to sit down and watch Dead End Driving again. And it, that movie is fantastic. I love it. Well, I'm with you. I mean, the origins of me seeing that movie was um, Duncan McLeish putting it on his Facebook page, you know, because as I said to Ricky Morgan, you know, I'm pretty sure the bloke's got bloody shares in Arrow or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the payroll. Oh, yeah, he's going to put a scooby Doo on us and put off a rubber mask and say, I'm really the manager for Arrow. Take over the world or something like that, you know? <laughs> really, I'm a Blu-ray developer, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. But um, I bought Dead End Driving, you know, I bought it from um, one of the retail stores over here and watched it. And then I, at the end of it, I thought, I actually enjoyed that film a little bit more than I should have done, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you said that on, on the show and it's just sort of like, and I think a lot of people walk away from that movie the same way. It's like, I, I like that. I, I'm not sure why. And clearly it's low budget. But you know what? It was kind of cool. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed it, as I mentioned in the last episode. But the thing that gets me with, when I look at the Arrow releases and stuff like that, it's just how many films, and I said this to Rick as well, you know, previous shows and that, how many films I haven't actually seen from the 80s? I mean, where do all these 80s movies come from? Do you know what I mean? It's like they're just sort of developing themselves or something like that, and I hope to see more of them. Yeah, is there some weird lab somewhere where they're they're just continually making 80s movies for no apparent reason? Yeah. Well, that's it. Maybe there's some alien invasion, some VHS alien invasion that we don't know about that's going on that's just turning out all these films. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a factory somewhere at Area 51. There's no aliens there. They're just, they're just making 80s movies. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. That's it. You know, one day we're going to turn on the news and there's going to be a load of people saying, you know, we've infiltrated Area 51 and all we found is a huge VCR just turning out for the HS. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's cold. It's cold. oh dear. Well, listen, on that note, we will leave you with that food for thought. Um, so, after reviewing Crocodile Dundee, me and the witch have found out there's an alien invasion of VHS <laughs> in the world. So, we'll leave you with that thought. But, um, hope you enjoyed the show, guys. Witch, thank you very much for coming on the show, mate. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's been good to have you here, mate. 
But guys, just before I go, uh, just a little bit of admin. Um, I'm a proud member of Legion Podcast, so go and check out all the other shows on that network. And you can find the show on iTunes, and I've also got a Facebook page, so if you want to join in, have some fun there. Uh, We've got some great members on that page that uh, regularly post stuff, and um, it's a really good place to be. So keep it 80s, have fun guys, and I will see you soon. this show then make sure you check out the other great shows on the legion podcast network like cinema psyops cinema beef devour the podcast duncan and Bo come correct exploding heads horror movie podcast friday the 13th get slayed the hell Ming power hour hello this is the doom show hero hero ghost show kill the cast underwater kaiju from outer space jerry hates action legion after dark metal health obsessive cinema discourse Pick Six Movies, the podcast by The Cemetery, the podcast on Haunted Hill, the Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.